Hello, and welcome to Checking the Vitals, a podcast powered by Specialty Care. I'm Todd Schlosser, and joining me today is Dr. Levy, MBA, a neurological surgeon. In this conversation, we discuss his transition from soldier to doctor, how a mentor's faith in his ability changed his medical career, and how new technologies can be used in healthcare to reduce the overall cost of healthcare. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Levy, so much for joining us this morning. I really appreciate your time. I'm glad to be here. I would love to... Uh, start off with a similar question I start off with every episode, and I really would love to know sort of when you des- developed your passion for wanting to work in healthcare in general, and um, you know what about healthcare made you develop that passion? Well, interestingly, um, you know I was back in college, way way back in the uh, in the eighties. I was originally kind of toying with the idea of being pre med, and then I decided um, to study economics instead, and then I went in the, into the military, and it was really I really kind of got the idea of going back to the whole idea of going to med school um, when I was in in the Marine Corps. And it was right around, I guess, around the, um, I'd say around 19, probably 91 or 90. And Mm -hmm. um, I talked to a friend uh, who told me about a program called post-baccalaureate pre-med training. Um, And so I started pursuing that. And then um, it really became available through that program. Uh, that I I realized I actually could do it because you know for the longest time I sort of presumed well I just I don't have that kind of academic discipline sure um, and I don't have that that kind of um, focus that I'd be able to do that and then I started getting interested and I decided I, I thought it would be a really a really great thing to do to be able to help people and serve yeah. in the uh, yeah. serve in the healthcare community as a physician and initially I, I my goal was to be a family medicine physician like a general practitioner. Right. Uh, just a general family medicine doctor um, mm-hmm. out in the community somewhere, maybe doing some sports medicine and things like that. I didn't sure. it didn't even occur to me that neurosurgery was a possible option. And okay. uh, so, you know, I started uh, but once I got involved in medical school and realized that I was able to compete with um, some of the better academicians there. Um, and then it, I did some rotations in neurosurgery. It became apparent to me that that's what I wanted to do. But initially I was I really was in the military, just kind of enjoying that career it was an excellent career. Yeah. Um, and then I just started thinking back, you know, I never really pursued the medicine thing. And it, it's really seems fascinating to me. And then again, a friend of mine told me about a program, um, which was a post-baccalaureate pre-bed program. And he said, yeah, that's, that's the starting point for a lot of people like you. And I'd never heard of it. So I pursued yeah. that and it yeah. worked out really well. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask you some questions about that? Because, and I'm not a doctor myself, so that's not something I'm familiar with either. So the, right. the baccalaureate pre-med program, how did you, I mean, obviously you had this conversation with your friend, but what sort of uh, requirements did you already meet that that are required for that program? Um, really what you, the only thing you really need for that program, the one I went to, is you need to have finished your undergraduate degree and okay. you need um, you needed to uh, not have applied uh, to med school and been rejected. Um, okay. This is for this was really for people who are interested in a mid career change. And um, it, you know it was interesting. I, I don't want to digress too much, but it was fascinating because this group of people that I knew in college, including the friend who told me about the post back, um, there was another friend who was a cardiac anesthesiologist at Hahnemann, which is now Drexel. Okay. Um, and uh, the the first friend said, well, why don't you call Fareed, you know, and talk to him? And because he's pretty senior at the hospital there. And actually, the way we all knew each other was from uh, karate, of all things. You know, we all <laughs> okay. practiced karate in college. And um, when I called, I got in touch with Fareed. And uh, he, when I met him, you know, he actually, the day I interviewed for, for the post back, he set me up to meet some of the people at Hahnemann. And um, one of the guys that he introduced me to was the um, sort of the deputy chair of cardiothoracic surgery, who also had just finished a tour on the admissions committee. Okay. And um, so I sat, it turned out also by, by chance that he was a three-star general in the army reserves. So okay. of course we sat there talking about the military for two and a half hours. Um, and, you know, this was all because of Fareed uh, Amin, he's, he's still a cardiac anesthesiologist, in fact, in Baltimore introducing yeah. me to this guy and uh, Dr. Strong, Michael Strong. And, um, you know, at the end of that kind of informal, not scheduled interview, he basically said, you know, you're, um, 
Uh, I'm going to really weigh in uh, on your behalf. I think you'd make an excellent candidate. So that was, I hadn't really officially left the Marine Corps yet. And I'm kind of a person, I'm always sort of a person who really covers their bases. I had a family at that point. So I wasn't, I wasn't going to leave my career in the Marine Corps, um, you know, which was relatively successful at that point without knowing for sure I'm going to med school. And once I had that, I knew I I felt confident I would get into the Bryn Mawr program. And when he said that, they had sort of a direct line to Hahnemann where you didn't have to take the MCAT, some other things. So um, oh, wow. once I once I talked to Dr. Strong and Farid, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Amin, I um, I kind of knew this is something that is going to happen. And that's when I really officially started putting in my, my paperwork in the Marine Corps to, to go to med school and get out of the Marines. And you had mentioned you already had a pretty successful Marine Corps career. I mean, if you don't mind me saying, when I was looking up information for this interview, it, you were a um, major at the time in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. So you were, I mean, uh, an officer in the Marine Corps when you decided to go yeah. into med school. Right. And I, I'd imagine that you didn't know you wanted to go to neurosurgery at that point. Were you still thinking general practitioner, family doctor at this point? Oh, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. Um, I, I didn't have any gauge of you what kind of academic ability I would have because sure. quite, quite frankly, my, my performance in college as an undergraduate was really not very good. Um, so, you know, I kind of was on, on this, my idea was, well, if, if I can even do this, I, I mean, family medicine is a good fit, something to be able to do. So I was, I was a captain in the Marine Corps. I ended up making major in the reserves while actually while I was in med school, but I was a captain in the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, I had a, a top secret, SCI level six clearance at DIA and, and um, uh, had worked um, for a total of two years on various trips in uh, Central America in support of a, an ally of the United States who was fighting a counterinsurgency. And so I had a lot of um, experience in the military and things military. And then obviously, you know, in a war zone bullet that you would want check um, that um, you know, would get me into that, that would have made a really long-term career in the Marine Corps. And um, I guess at some point I, I was just a little bit dissatisfied, uh, it, you know, with where things were in one or two particular jobs. And that's when I really started thinking back again about going into medicine. So, I mean, it sounds to me like, you know, you ha- sort of had a career in the military and then I would say, I don't, I don't want to say late in life, but late for what most people go into medicine I would assume you decide to yeah. switch careers into medicine, thinking you're going to be in family practice. What at that point? Well, and you already mentioned that you did rounds and during the neurosurgery rounds, you were like, wow, this is the route for me. But just from what you said earlier um, mm-hmm. about, you know, you thought that family practice would have been a better route for you early on before you probably did rounds. What was it about the neurosurgical mm-hmm. rounds that made you think, oh, no, that's the path for me? When I did my surgery rotations, mm-hmm. this is third year, you know, which is your first clinical year. Yeah. Um, it was on the surgery rotation. And they have a thing where you have to do a two weeks, um, I believe, of orthopedics and obviously two weeks of general surgery. And then you can do two weeks of, of whatever you want. So I chose neurosurgery thinking, well, I'll never see this again. You know, maybe I'll get to see a, a brain operation. Sure. And yeah. um, so I, I spent the two, two weeks on the service with the residents there and, you know, getting getting the kind of you know, I guess chewing out and, and getting yelled at and, you know, being the, the fumbling medical student on the service. Um, but I, I really put a lot of effort into it. And at the end of the rotation, they used to meet for breakfast in the morning at the cafeteria at Hahnemann before they would um, round on the patients. And um, so I was sitting at the breakfast meeting at like, you know, 530 or whatever it was in the morning. Yeah. And the chief resident says, uh, says to me, so when do you, when are you going to reply uh, to be a neurosurgeon? I was like, uh, well, you know, I actually had been thinking about it pretty seriously. And they said, well, we think you do very well and you should do it. So I, I did. I, that was really what kind of made me, I mean, my, my mentor, I guess, at that point in that process um, was Dr. Tom Generelli, who was the chairman at Hahnemann at the time. And um, he ended up uh, as a chairman in Madison for a while. And I think he's still working, but he, um, he really was very encouraging, and he, um, I knew he would write really good letters on my behalf and, and, um, and all the things I needed, and I kind of felt like it, it was sort of meant to be, um, yeah. so that's when I really decided to apply. Yeah. Sometimes you got to follow that sort of kismet, for lack of a better word, when it comes up, you know, uh, and right. I, I do think, and this may just be because of personal experiences I've had in my life, having someone outside of yourself say, 
you really seem like you have a grasp on whatever that is, is a huge confidence boost in whatever that is, you know? Right. So I can definitely see that being like, oh, maybe I am smart enough or am talented enough or am skilled enough to do neurosurgery or, you know, whatever it is. So that's actually super interesting. So you, you at that point go and apply for, uh, I, I'm assuming a residency in neurosurgery. Where did you end up doing that residency? Right. So yeah, I um, actually did three uh, neurosurgical rotations, um, one at University okay. of Louisville, one at Temple University, and one at, um, at Hahnemann, obviously. Yeah. And um, I also did a neurology rotation. This is all fourth year, which is really when you're kind of figuring out exactly what you want to do. Um, so that's I at the match application, I believe, had to be in like December or January. Um, yeah. So I had been in Louisville and the chairman there, uh, Chris Shields, was very encouraging and, you know, made it clear that, you know, I would do fine if I went there. And also the chairman at Temple, Raj Narayan, did the same thing. He kind of communicated that, you know, I would do well there. Um, so that's how I kind of did my ranking based on, you know, the places that um, that really made it that I'd rotated. And then I, I interviewed I, the interview trail that year was 19 programs. I went to 19 different interviews. Oh, wow. Um, well. And, you know, again, it's one of these things, like I said, I've always been a kind of a cover the bases kind of guy. So I wanted yeah. to just every place that said you can come, I went to um, and I got really good responses from just about everybody. Um, you know, I was really pleased with the way that went. But, it, you know, it was it was a tough road. And then when I turned the match list in, I, I ranked every program um, as far as, you know, as many as I was allowed. And um, and I matched in Louisville. So that's where I ended up doing my training at University of Louisville. Excellent. And I, from what I understand, and obviously you're the neurosurgeon, so correct me if I'm wrong, the neurosurgical residency is one of the longer residencies, correct? Is it seven or eight years? It depends on where you go. Um, okay. When I went through, it was six and okay. they turned it into a seven year program the next year. Oh, um, okay. So I got, I got out in six years, which was great um, for me. Yeah. And then seven years the next year. And then um, there are programs now where they, they, and what are called unfolded fellowships, where they put periods of extra training in very specific specialties of neurosurgery um, okay. within the program. So those generally tend to run eight years. Um, okay. So it's now longer. I mean, the shortest programs are seven years, the longer ones are eight. And then some people even do a fellowship on top of that. Yeah, um, I've heard those. Yeah. But like, for example, yeah. So for example, Thomas Jefferson, they have enfolded training in endovascular and in spine uh, and okay. in functional. So you, you come out of that program really being able to do, you know, everything in neurosurgery, um, which is, which is unusual. Even, even now it's, it's unusual to do that. So those are, those are longer programs. Yeah. So did you go on and do a fellowship after your six year residency? No, you know, I, I started med school. I was 30. I had a family yeah. and, um, I just, to me, I, I, in some respects, I kind of wish I had, I think, but, um, you know, it, it was too much at that point. I was already, gosh, let's see. So, I was, I was 42 when I finished wow, okay. um, a residency. And back then they, they didn't pay, you know, nowadays the residents are paid re relatively well. Yeah. We were paid. I think my first year I made like $16,000 or something as an intern, which was yeah. much less than I had as a captain in the Marine Corps. Sure. Um, so, you know, I was really ready to go out and, and make some money. And I, I went on active duty in the Navy, was a Navy neurosurgeon after residency for four years. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've, you've done two of the four branches of the military or four major branches of the military, I should say. Yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm actually a retired commander uh, in the Navy. So I got, oh, wow. Years okay. In Mexico, so, yeah. so you did a few years in the Navy. And then when you uh, finished that, finished your neurosurgical uh, career in the Navy, uh, and I'm assuming you went somewhere and either joined a practice or, uh, or set up your own. So what was that uh, post naval neurosurgical career like? Yeah, so I um I started at Chesapeake Regional Medical Center uh, in in Chesapeake, Virginia. I was there yeah. for because we we were my son was in high school and you know we didn't want to at that point kind of disrupt things. So I assume I was there for about three in the years. Navy too. Of yeah, the big so I was at Portsmouth. Base. So we yeah, okay. stayed in the same house, didn't have to move. So awesome. um yeah, so I did that for um for three years. I was I think I was the assistant chief of surgery or something like that. So I did some administrative stuff as well as um the practice. Uh, and then from there, I, I actually left there and went to uh, practice in uh, principally Ohio and some, in, we covered so West Virginia hospital also. Okay. Um, and then yeah, eventually that the hospital in Ohio offered me a position as the chief of surgery and the director of neuroscience. So I took, I took that. Awesome. I was there for, uh, until I kind of sort of semi-retired, which is what I'm doing now. Yeah. 
Well, I and imagine, and I, I've talked to a lot of surgeons who are quote unquote semi-retired, <laughs> and it, it doesn't really seem like you are retired. Well, maybe not necessarily you, but I've talked to a lot of surgeons who are like, yeah, I retired three years ago, and like their schedules are still crazy. Like they're still working all the time. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I, I come up here to um, from Virginia to Racine, Wisconsin, two weeks a month, and oh wow, I just signed on with a company where I'm going to be doing working with their um, their insurance uh, group um, to look at some of the claims and whatnot. And I've yeah. done that also in the past. Um, so I have those things, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's not going to be slow. I actually, I my own consulting firm as well. Um, so I'm, I'm as busy really as I ever was. Uh, and it's, it, the, you know, the semi-retired thing is really only refers to active neurosurgical practice. I still practice two weeks a month. Uh, and then the rest of the time I'm, I'm actually very busy. Yeah. It sounds like you're in rain scene, Wisconsin, uh, for two weeks out of the month too. So it's like, I, that's I a whole month of work right there. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it is, it's, it's, um, I'm on call for two solid weeks. So it's, it's, it feels that way, um, yeah. especially when you start getting elective cases and things, which we're, which we're doing up here. Yeah. So I, I, I know a very sort of high level neurosurgery, uh, typically one either focuses on, on the brain or the spine. Did you have a specialty in which you focused or were you more of a general neurosurgeon? Sure. Um, I was really a generalist, although my the last full time thing I did in Ohio, I did mostly spine and peripheral nerve. Um, yeah. Here, it actually ends up being probably more brain cases than spine because the okay. the permanent partners here do the majority of the elective spine cases. So okay, but yeah, I mean, I I probably did more spine. Yeah, I just want to sort of gauge how long you've been at. Um, this neurosurgical career. So when was it that you actually started in the Navy? I believe it was your first neurosurgical position. So when, what, what year was that? If you don't mind my asking. That was 2004. Um, okay, so I was there from 2004 to 2008. So, so yeah. almost, I guess, 18 years, not quite 20 years that you've been doing it. Yeah. I'd imagine that there have been a lot of innovations along the way. So what are some of the bigger changes that you see in neurosurgery from 2004 to today? So, Probably the biggest, um, the two biggest things are uh, the endovascular approaches to vascular malformations and aneurysms, things like that. Um, that was just getting started when I was in residency. And now it's kind of almost the standard of care. Um, yeah. You see a lot more of these abnormalities that are treated endovascularly or with some combination of endovascular and open surgery than you do just straight open surgery. Um, it's, much, it's much more common to see these things treated that way. And the, um, the other thing I would say is sort of the, the spine constructs are much more, um, I guess, biomechanically competent in some respects. They're much more, they're much better designed biomechanically. The instrumentation uh, holds well, it, it, it's easy to use. There are all sorts of tools now, um, you know, like power screwdrivers, and there's this the image guidance, um, there's a system called OARM, which really lets you see exactly where you're putting your screws in. And, yeah. and um, you know, robotics is becoming a big thing in spine as well. A lot of people are using it. Um, and so it's it's really, uh, I'd say the two probably biggest things would be the endovascular stuff, like I said, and then, and then the spine between the robotic and minimally invasive and the quality um, and sort of biomechanical design of the instrumentation has vastly improved from when I was in training. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that that's true. And I, I, I would imagine, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that because of things like navigation and robotics and really being able to get within millimeters of where you want that screw, if not right where you want it, mm -hmm. uh, and to couple all that with minimally invasive, so you're not like fully opening someone up. A lot of those positive repercussions of those techniques and technologies have been you know, lower time in the hospital, just better outcomes in general. Like, can you talk through some of the way that those innovations have impacted sort of medicine? Sure. Um, well, you know, a lot of the minimally invasive procedures, the, the pain scale after surgery is much, much lower. Yeah. The use of medication is much lower. Um, the discharge time from surgery to discharge is shorter. And um, in general, I think most of the outcomes are comparable, open to minimally invasive. Um, but the overall, I guess the overall hospital course tends to be a lot more efficient with the minimally invasive things. And there are some guys who can do 
you know, really, really big procedures in a minimally invasive fashion. Um, so that's, those are probably the key advantages. Um, you know, not as much in that way, but just because I like to sort of see the field. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, that's really where things are going and the use of the robotic systems, which, um, you know, are really catching on that, that also yeah. massively helps with the minimally invasive approaches and, uh, you know, the, the length of hospital stay and the accuracy of screw placement, all of those things. You mentioned it briefly a, a moment ago, but the um, consulting work that you do, is that done through like the affordable healthcare solutions? Is that yes. the consulting that, and I, I only bring that up because um, when I was researching this interview, I was able to, I stumbled upon, upon that website and that's where I got, there's a great bio that you have on that website and that really uh, informed a lot of the questions that I got out of this. So anyone who's interested in more, about the career that you've gone through, I would recommend going there and checking it out. But do you mind if I ask what type of work you do specifically through the consulting? Sure. We are principally focused on, um, on establishment of neuroscience centers of excellence. And um, we also work to, if somebody has a neuroscience center that's not quite as functional as it could be, or maybe they're not, um, they're not making fiscal goals, or they have rapid turnover personnel. Um, our goal is to make it, uh, you know, that much more functional and that much more capable, so that people working there are happy and they they get the job done in a way that makes um, you know monetary sense. Yeah. So, really, that's our focus. But we kind of do we we can do a little of everything. If you if you, you saw the website, you see some of the folks that are on there have an enormous amount of experience. Um, yes, that that group of guys I've assembled. So. Yeah, we um, we can do a lot of things. The next thing we we want to start doing a little bit um, is AI and blockchain in healthcare. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to digress too much, but um, I, I work with a company that does um, blockchain trading to facilitate agricultural exchange. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's called Producers Market. Do you see the that blockchain technology sort of working its way into healthcare over the next three five years or so? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and in, in several areas, I think in, um, in billing contracts and reimbursement contracts, but also yeah. in equipment purchases. Um, yeah, there's a, there's an awful lot. Of, we had for decades, I think, um, general president Eisenhower, um, had warned about the industrial military complex. Yeah. And well, one of his farewell speeches was military industrial. Yeah. The military industrial complex. We, we have in this country, a massive, medical industrial complex, um, which, which is a huge part of that, obviously, is government. And so in order to really make those trades, you know, above board, honest, in compliance with all of the appropriate laws, the solution really to that is blockchain trading. Um, because, you know, as I'm sure you're well aware, you know, blockchain is basically two contractual entities meet and then artificial intelligence discerns whether or not those contractual obligations have been met before executing a trade, but it enables complete transparency because it has all, when that comes to the table for trade, every prior contract is also something you can see and all the things feeding into it. And that's one of the things that producers market does and why I, I find them as such an attractive company to be involved with is they use have their own proprietary software called Storybird. And they use that to companies that, trade through their system and that are represented on their website, use Storybird to show, you know, here is a piece of fruit. This is everything that was done to get that piece of fruit to your table. You know, we're completely transparent. We do it in a way that's environmentally sustainable and responsible. Yeah. Um, and I, I really do think there's a huge role for that in, in healthcare. And it's kind of the future in almost all transactions. It kind, kind of takes away middlemen. Kind of. Takes I was going to say, like, it sounds to me like it really takes away a lot of the middlemen, which um, if you, and maybe you wouldn't use these words, so don't allow me to put them in your mouth, but a lot of the bloat, I think, in the healthcare system is due to a lot of the middlemen that, and as of now, and, you know, 20, 30, 60 years ago, they served a function, they had a need, there was a need for them, but now the blockchain can sort of make them redundant and hopefully overall bring that cost of healthcare down, I assume, is what you're looking to do. I mean, and largely just because the name of your organization uh, is again, affordable healthcare, healthcare solutions. So I'd imagine that you're looking at making things more affordable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that is the key. Um, the bloat that you're talking about where there is a sort of a hand in the till at every level that that's present in 
it's ubiquitous in multiple industries. Oh yeah, healthcare is not and, unique in that. No, you know, in fact, there was a there's an old um, thing that came out a few years ago where some senior executive at ADM said, yeah, there's tons of money to be made in food, just not if you're a farmer. And yeah. one of the things that that PM tries to do is they they eliminate all of that so that instead of eight cents on the dollar going to a farmer's pocket, 40 cents on the dollar goes to a farmer's pocket. And, and that's exactly where healthcare needs to be. You know, one of the reasons that there's another reason there's so much bloat is because physician reimbursements and reimbursements to hospitals have been cut so much. So yes. people are trying to do more to make the same kind of income they, they used to make in quote unquote, the good old days. And, and that leads to, that's one of the reasons I do locum tenens because I only, I get paid the same one way or the other. So I, I only do what I feel absolutely needs to be done. And I can always put, I don't have to worry about hospital administration pressure from there. I don't have to worry about, you know, meeting some, you know, theoretical idea that the administrators have how much work I should be doing. I just do what I need to do. And that's it. And that's, it's a great way to practice. And I, I really believe that the blockchain AI um, trading systems, even the ones that are already available, but certainly the ones that are coming are going to make that much more a reality for a lot more physicians um, and nursing staff, APMPs, people like that, and CRNAs, and, and just make, make things much more honest, above board, and transactional. Yeah. Money comes in, it goes to the physicians, goes to the appropriate places, and yeah. there aren't all these people in between with their hands in the till. I'd imagine that a lot of the physician nursing burnout that we talk about so much just because it is a very, very real thing um, would be mitigated some if they felt like they were being compensated the way they should have been or should be. Um, so we're moving a lot of the middlemen and sort of like the company that you're working with now that does blockchain currently in farming that are, are trying to raise that eight cents on the dollar for farmers. If we can do more or less the same thing, I'm not sure what the figures would be, but you know, return some of that middleman bloat income to the clinicians and physicians and you know practitioners of medicine that would help keep burnout. I mean, burnout, I think happens in any line of business, but sure. um, I feel like if you feel like you're being compensated what you're worth, that would help mitigate some of that. Yeah, that that's true. And I mean, the other thing uh, that the other thing that's important to realize is a lot of the shortfall, economic shortfall in the healthcare industry would also be eliminated. Um, and yeah, I mean, so for example, I've seen practices where and I'm, I'm not being critical here. I'm just, it's an sure. observation. Um, the physicians feel so pressured to meet certain financial obligations from the hospital and their practice and whatever. They, they tend to do more um, rather than less. And in medicine, in my mind, after almost 20 years of doing this after residency, less is almost always more when you're talking about patient care. Um, the less you do uh, in surgery, um, prescribing, you know, the more the patient does and the better the patient does. So less is more in medicine and exactly the opposite is what the current system kind of encourages. Um, because, you know, you have to realize, and I'm not, um, you know, certainly I I've done very well financially. I'm not complaining at all in my own, in my own situation, but a lot of physicians come out of school. Um, and they have massive debt, uh, and they're, if they're in a primary care specialty or some other specialty, their reimbursement may not be very high in relative terms. Yeah. And now they've got, they want to live a nice life after, you know, struggling in residency for three years or four years plus a fellowship. Um, and they want to be able to afford these things. They want to live a certain lifestyle, which is always, I mean, people go into medicine to help other people make no mistake, but there's always, you know, an idea of financial recompense as well. People do consider that making that decision. And so, you know, when you're, you become pressured, if you're not reaching those financial goals to do yeah. more and more and more and more, and that's when quality outcomes go down. And that's when, um, you know, the physician burnout starts happening. As you can imagine, like, for instance, in my case, um, so I, I have, let's just say I have a big case on a Wednesday and I'm on call on a Tuesday. Well, you know, if I get, if I'm up all night on call, then I have to go operate the next day, all day. And then, you know, I, I go home, I finally get into bed and I get 14 phone calls from the inpatients about, you know, my back hurts, this hurts, that sort. Yeah. That's when people do get burned out. And even, yeah. you know, you go like, if you go to a national meeting and you see people constantly answering pages and phones from, you know, from their office, 
Um, so yeah, that's kind of where a lot of that comes from. And I, I really believe if if there was a much more efficient, streamlined way, probably less setting of reimbursement by the government, or at least increasing it, um, you know, I think things would be a lot more functional and physicians would feel a lot better about what they were doing and more appreciated. And they'd feel less pressure to just constantly be constantly working. And, you know, I think the other thing a lot of people don't realize is I I remember once I was watching TV and uh, I think his name is Neil Cavuto said something about, you know, he's interviewing a doctor and he said something like, Oh, it's a pretty cushy job. And I was thinking to myself, no, Now, what you do is a cushy job. (laughs) What I do is not a cushy job. I mean, you know, I've had cases, 30 hour cases where, you know, I I left the room once to go to the bathroom or, you know, and, and um, one, one interview I had uh, up in New York with a guy named Charlie Hodge, he's, he's retired now, but um, I'll never forget this just in the interview. I didn't go to his training program, but um, I'll never forget this. He said, you know, the one thing you have to realize is every single thing you do as a neurosurgeon, everything, everything has a potential to ruin someone's life. So if you, yeah. you could be doing a carpal tunnel release and if you just, if you miss the mark and you injure the recurrent branch of that median nerve, they have, they lose the use of their thumb, which is a life thing. That's a huge yeah. life thing. And I, you know, he, that just in an interview that just put things in such an incredible perspective for me. Um, and so, yeah, it's not a cushy job. It's a ton of pressure. It's a huge, a huge responsibility. Yeah. Um, and you know, those, those sort of jobs that, you know, let's face it. I mean, in the United States, there are 3,200 neurosurgeons, um, and about, about, you know, what, 330 million people. So that tells you the ratio. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a, it's not, not many people do it and it's a very important job, but not just neurosurgery. All of medicine is like that. Yeah. So people should be compensated fairly and they shouldn't feel pressure to produce like you're on a production line or you're, you know, you're making widgets or something like that. Yeah. And that's what I hope. Um, I really think that um, as we go forward with more the AI and the blockchain trading and all of these things really develop, I think it's going to really make things a lot more efficient. We're just talking a little bit about burnout. So what are some things that surgeons or people who are entering, like they just passed their, they just finished with their fellowship. What can they look for in business partners or practices they're looking to join or hospitals they're wanting to work with? What are some maybe red flags or green flags of this is a good place to work? These are good people to work with. Sure. Um, So let's start with the red flags first. Um, So if you are looking at an employment contract and I I would advise you you don't have to be an attorney to read. I have not had an attorney review a contract in, in 10 years. And I've okay. been very well served by the contracts I've signed. Um, you should know how to read your own contract and you should know what you're looking at. Um, some of the red flags immediately, number one, and you need to ask about this. And sometimes there's no getting around it, but it's very important. It's called a hammer clause in the, in the um, malpractice insurance where the malpractice insurer reserves the right to settle a suit without your consent. So if you're sued and you're completely oh. right and you are you own this you're com- you were completely in the right but the insurer believes it is monetarily in their best interest to just settle rather than incur court costs they can do that behind your back and that then goes on the record as you being culpable. Um so I would imagine that would also raise your insurance rates. It can it doesn't okay. always it depends okay. on how many of those things have happened but um you know uh, that's one of the things that that's really important. So that's number one is a hammer clause. You, you don't, you don't want to go somewhere where the malpractice insurer has that. And it's sometimes if that's the only insurance they have, and you really want to go to that practice, well, you know, you take your chances, but at least go in knowing, you yeah. know, what you're, what you're going up against. And number two, if you have a contract that's got, you know, 15 complex, complex ways of describing your no compete, um, like, you know, they're, they're, the, the no compete, you know, you can only do it within this many miles and it just goes on and on and on. That's probably not a place you want to go because they're, they're planning on protecting themselves, not if you leave, but when you leave. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, a no compete is a reasonable and there are, but there are other places that don't have them at all. And that usually if a place doesn't have a hammer clause, doesn't have a no compete, um, then you're, you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, if they do have those things and they're really just in iron, um, then that's probably not a place where you're going to be happy. And, and they know that that's why they write the contracts that way. Yeah. I was going to um, say, I've worked at places that had non-competes and places that hadn't, didn't have non-competes. And 
I have always found that the culture of the organizations that didn't have non-competes were types of cultures that made me want to stay at that company. Yeah, exactly. And that's why they do it that way. Yeah. Um, the other, the next thing is when you join a practice, um, you have to be careful of someone who has been there, quote unquote, built the practice, been there for, you know, 50 years. It's his way or the highway or her way or the highway. Um, and, you know, you, you really, you're not going to get mentoring out of that person. That person has every aspect of the practice funneling income into their personal coffers, including what you do. Um, and is the owner and there's a huge, a very expensive buy-in and on and on and on. Um, those sort of uh, things, you, you don't want to get involved in that because you're not going to be happy. And especially when you start having somebody ostensibly more experienced, but possibly not current, telling you everything you want to do um, yeah. and how to do it. And this is what you're going to do. That that's That's a bad thing. And the last thing I would really be concerned about is administration. You really need to feel out the administration. And you need to talk independently to physicians who work at that facility outside of the context of you're being recruited into that practice. You need to talk independently. Like, for instance, I had a guy after I left Chesapeake who called and said, what's it like at Chesapeake? Out, completely outside of anything. Yeah. Um, and I, I told him I was completely honest with him. You know, there are good things, there are bad things. Um, but, you know, that's what you need to do because administration can make or break your ability to work in any field. Yeah. And they can make things really difficult. I mean, if you're constantly going to be getting phone calls, second guessing everything you did or said on the floor um, and, you know, well, you weren't you were you were irritable on the phone. Gosh, let's give him a little black check and like to his name, those sort of things, you know, or they're constantly coming up with these big, grandiose plans that really aren't going to go anywhere. And, you know, they're not going to go anywhere. Um, yeah. That That's not a group you want to get involved in. So, so those are the red flags. Now, the green flags. The green flags are if your partners and you can anybody who's got any ability to judge personality can do this. Are your partners collegial? Are they nice guys? Um, you know, what are their financial commitments relative to you? Like, are they going to expect you not to carry your load? Because, of course, you have to carry your load. But right. are they going to expect you to be some huge contribution to their income? Um, if they're if they're guys that are collegial, they're well trained, they've got good reputations, you know, the, the patients are happy with them. Um, and you get that good vibe when you're talking to them, uh, then that's a really positive thing. So partners in a practice is huge. Um, if you can go someplace where there is mentorship, not like I said, you know, the guy who is um, desperately trying to get every single last string of income before he finally, you know, at the age of 81 decides he's not going to work anymore. Right. Um, you know, somebody who's a true mentor, who's going to be there to help you out when you need help. Um, that's a huge plus because when you're just starting, especially in something like neurosurgery, it always helps to have somebody who really knows what they're doing, where you can say, Hey, I have a really tough case. Can you come in and give me a hand? Sure. Um, yeah. so that's, that's definitely a plus sign. Um, and I'd imagine the willingness to do that to exactly. say, I'd love to love to help you out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's really important. Um, so, and then, you know, obviously your, um, financial recompense is very, very important. Uh, it doesn't, have to be in the top, you know, 0.001%, um, but something that's going to enable you to pay off your loans and, you know, have a nice car that you want to buy and, you know, a decent place to live. Um, that's really important, um, obviously. And then another thing that a lot of people don't really look at, or they kind of think, well, it's probably not so bad. You know, it's a level two center. Gosh, you know, I'll be okay. I'll, and this is the call schedule. Yeah. You don't want to be at a place where, three guys are senior active, so they don't take call and you and two other guys take all the call. And especially if it's a level two center, level two center is basically almost the same as a level one, except that there's one or two things usually they don't do. Um, so, you know, those kind of calls will, will make it impossible to function. And I, more people by far, the, the two things that really get people to leave a practice um, by far are number one, if your partners are screwing you and number two, um, if the call schedule is just brutal and you can't function because you're always yeah. exhausted. Yeah. Um, so if you go to a place where the call schedule is reasonable and you know you, you can count on your partners, they're not going to dump a lot of stuff on you, you know, um, that's that's a real, that's a green flag. Um, obviously, if the call schedule is brutal, that's a red flag. Yeah. Um, and finally, you know, the 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 final green flag is your overall gestalt for the place. You, when you're interviewing for um, for a job after residency or after fellowship, you really need to look at a lot of places. Um, you shouldn't just limit yourself to one place. 
uh, or, you know, I mean, unless say in the fellowship, they're really recruiting you and you really know the place and you, you, you want to stay on there. That's, 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 that's another issue. But if you're looking completely independently and you're looking at different, go to a lot of places, really listen to what they say. And when you find a place where the administration and the practice and everybody are sort of integrated, really focused on patient care more than anything else, um, and there's not this constant talk of bottom line or productivity and things like that, that's a green flag. That's a place you should really strongly consider. They should be willing to pay for you to get there for your interviews. Sure. They should be willing um, you know, to uh, cover your meeting costs when you go to, you have to go to meetings. They should cover that you know, really fairly. Um, and any place like that, that's really going to take good care of you. It's a gestalt you're going to get. Um, that's kind of the thing you're looking for. I mean, honestly, it sounds like that um, a lot of those places or a lot of those red and green flags are things that are transferable, I think, to almost any industry. You sure. want to look for a place that's mission driven, not money driven. You want to look for a place that takes care of you, not takes care of themselves. You know, so I feel like a lot of those uh, I mean, you spoke specifically to medicine, uh, which is great yeah. for you know our listenership. But I feel like a lot of those core values are things that you want to look for in any line of business, or really people who just treat you and those uh, and others with respect, and that's what you you want. So that's great, great yeah. information. Let me close with one final question, though. Sure. Um, I, I'm sure you're at the point in your career now where you have people who look to you uh, to maybe. Uh, be their mentor, or maybe you are currently mentoring people. How do you um, approach the subject of what specialty should I go into? Should I look at neurosurgery? So how would you talk to somebody or what maybe even red flags and green flags or positives and negatives would you have for neurosurgery as a specialty? So with the general, um, we'll we'll do the general question of how to decide what you want to do. Um, make that second. The first part will be neurosurgery. Okay. If you decide you really want to be a neurological surgeon, um, there's a couple of things you you really need to accept. One is that it's not easy and it will never be easy. Um, you know, there's an old saying that if something was easy, everybody do it. Yeah. Um, and, and this job is not easy. It's, it's um, you can get to a point in your career when you've been doing it long enough where your judgment gets much more sound. And that case you would have run to the OR at two o'clock in the morning, you know, 20 years ago, you're like, now this patient will be fine without surgery. Um, and those are the sort of things that become easier. But but in, as far as a choice to make this your career, I, I, what I would say is definitely rotate when you have the opportunity to do those rotations in medical school as often and as many places as you can. Um, you, know, you, you need to know what you're getting yourself into. Talk to the residents, learn what it's going to be like in residency and speak to the attendings and what kind of a career. Um, you know, from my standpoint, there, there's nothing else I would want to do in medicine. Um, and you know, even so there's times when I have really big, tough cases where, you know, there's trepidation and you're worried, you know, you want to really do a great job for the person and, and, uh, gosh, you know, how's this going to, going to work out? Um, but even so the challenges, uh, are the intellectual challenges are, you know, as, as good as any, if not second to none in, in all of medicine and there, the opportunities to really, really concretely help people and save lives. Uh, really as much or more than any other specialty. I mean, you save so many lives. Um, you know, even if you're taking call to a place that's not a trauma center, you still have people come in with these problems that you can take care of emergently. So yeah. saving lives, making lives better, um, if that really appeals to you in a, an extraordinarily complex environment um, that requires total commitment and total focus, um, then that then neurosurgery is something you should definitely consider. And then as to how to pick what you want to do coming out of med school, um, I would say rotate on as many different services as you can outside of the, uh, the required clinical uh, services. And, you know, in when I rotated in medical school, every single service I was on, I came off of that service saying, well, I could do that for a living. It, it really, except for one, and that's, that doesn't matter which one that was, but um, Really, uh, I came off, but but it was really with neurosurgery where I was, you know, really got to be close with the residents and and the attendings seemed very much interested in my career, and I was being mentored and being sort of brought along, even as a medical student. Um, that was really, and and they didn't pull any punches. I mean, I can remember a couple of times, and this one guy, um, uh, Casey, uh, Doctor Casey, was just brutal. You know, you should have yeah. read, you should have done this, should have done that. Um, and just to kind of let you know what it's like. I mean, a lot of that was important, just letting me know this is what it's going to be like. Um, so, you know, for any specialty that you want to be in, rotate as often as you can, do away rotations when you're in medical school, see what it's like at other places, 
And um, then, you know, as as you start to develop a real interest, the, I think the the final the final choice of what you decide you want to do will kind of speak to you. Um, yeah. But but expose yourself to as much as possible. Well, Dr. Charles Levy, I really want to thank you for your time today and joining us on Checking the Vitals. My pleasure. I was really happy to be here. And I hope some of the things we talked about can help some other young physicians or medical students, residents figure out what they want to do. I'm sure it will. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Checking the Vitals. If you enjoyed the content we provide, please leave us a five-star rating and review. It really does help people find the show. And make sure you subscribe so you hear our interviews with healthcare innovators every Monday.